Hello, hello, Shagatha Known here. Welcome to another Rust coding stream here on the 7th of November, 2022. Local time is 1821. Getting started a little bit late today, but let's not waste too much time. But I want to show kind of where we're at. This is the last state of the game. If you follow my... Um, why does it look different? Maybe it's just because I expanded the screen. Or maybe I was using the wrong symbol all along. <laughs> Was I using an exclamation mark? It should have been the up, upside down one. Oh, that's fine. So I was going to mention that. If you follow these, um, you know that at the end of the last one, I said I was going to clone down or, you know, get an exact copy of the project at this point. That way, any, um, any discrepancies are accounted for, just like tiny little bits and bobs that maybe I missed or I typed just slightly incorrectly um, would not affect the project going forward. So this is the clone of that basically. I guess I already had it cloned. I had the repo cloned and it has every lesson in it already. So I just pulled that one out and slapped it into my folder. And I think we should be fine. Did that, did that goblin run over a trap? So yeah, we last time we added a few cool things. We got like the hunger clock. I think we did that the time before, but uh, we have traps now. So you see that um, carrot up there, that red carrot is actually a trap that we've discovered. Um, it wasn't triggered. The way the traps were set up by default uh, is that they disappear after you hit them. So if we step on it, it's now gone. Um, I did a little bit of a extra thing last time that actually made them stay after they were triggered, but they would no longer trigger again. So you could do stuff like that. Um, I think, yeah, so there's one other thing and I wanna check this out. So if we go, if we back out of this and I hit begin new game, we have a problem here. We don't actually begin a new game. So that's a bug that I found last time and I spent some time getting a, a bit of a working solution in place. Really what's happening is when you hit new game on the menu, it doesn't actually generate all the new resources and everything. The way the game is designed right now in the code base is that we actually, in main, we spend some time generating resources like um, the map and the player and the player entity and such. We do that here when we start the game up and that's what's in, in memory when we hit the new game option from the main menu. So, when we hit new game here, we literally just set our, our run state to pre-run and um, pre-run, run systems, maintain, and it awaits input. So it doesn't actually, nowhere in here are we generating new resources. So that is a bit of a bug that I discovered last time. It's not the hardest thing to fix, but um, you know, you wanna try and factor, like factor out generic or, or reused parts of the code because there's going to be some similarities to um, like uh, going down to the next level, right? If you, um, or if you die, if you die, I think it does clean everything up. I might be wrong. We could test it actually, but um, let's see, let's test that. When you go down to the next level, it has to generate a bunch of, uh, ooh, that looks funky. It has to generate, what is that? What? Oh, that was the mouse. Okay. It just got stuck there. Um, when you go to the next level, it it generates a bunch of, like, it, a new map, and it deletes all the resources and stuff. So there's a lot of common code there with what you would need to do anyway when you're starting the, uh, the new game. But it would just be something good to take into account. And here we go. I'm going to wait until I die. All right. We return to the menu. We begin new game. And see, we're fine. In this case... It does clean everything up and, and build new resources and stuff for us. So that's all well and good. Um, just that one case where it's a bit of a problem. So I'm trying things a little bit differently here today as well by putting the console over here. We don't care too much about the console. Apparently if I mouse around it too much, it lags things. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know why this happens with certain things. My machine is definitely capable. Um, CPU is sitting at 7% right now, so it's definitely capable. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to try a couple new things now to maybe make this look a little nicer. 
I don't know how well this is going to work out because I'm going to have to retrain some of my workflow. But um, we're going to put the console over here. It's not that important for most of what we're doing. It's a little smushed having to go onto separate lines and all that. That's okay. And then I'm going to try something like this. Uh, no, I thought I could do that. Oh, yeah, you can. So I can actually open up files like that as well um, and not keep the Explorer open. That lets more more room uh, be on screen for the code. So that's enough of that. We got to get to the good stuff. So let's look at some procedurally generating maps. I don't think we're really going to be doing that today. We're going to be doing a map build, refactoring of the map build. And if time permits, I'll also be doing um, this test harness, which I think we're, from what I've seen just by skimming through, I think the test harness is what's going to allow us to basically generate a map with any algorithm and see the results. So we can then experiment with it. That's what I, I've seen. Uh, we'll see how it actually goes. But these are both going to be a little lengthy, so we'll see how much happens today. Um, so the tutorial now. This started out as part of section two, but I realized it was a large open topic. The larger roguelike games, such as Dungeon Crawl, Stone Soup, Cogmind, Caves of God, etc., all have a variety of maps. Section three is all about map building, and we'll cover many of the available algorithms for procedurally building interesting maps. Let me take a look at one thing that just popped up over here. Um, there was a message that popped up. Okay. I was just trying to see what it was because it looked possibly concerning. But I wasn't sure what it was. Um, all right. So far, we've really just had one map design. It's different every time unless you hit a repeat random seed, which is a great start, but the world of procedural generation leaves so many more possibilities. Over the next few chapters, we'll start building a few different map types. Now, this is something where I want to take a bit of a personal aside here and say this is one of the most interesting parts to me. I really like the idea of looking further into um, procedural generation. I have a lot of ideas of things I want to procedurally generate, and some of it... I. I think the BSP interior design binary space partitioning that might be relevant to some of the ideas I have. Some of these will have nothing to do with some of the things I want to build, but just getting more experience with these concepts are going to be really helpful for me um, because there's a lot of like real legit stuff in here that's used in you know two D three D games all over the place, right? So this is going to be useful stuff. Um, wave function collapse is really interesting. I, I you know there's a YouTube video I had a, a while back. It's like why I've switched to using wave function collapse for my maps. It's like, it's a legit, it's legit stuff, right? It's not just confined to roguelikes. Um, that's not to say they're not legit, but um, what I mean by that is it is very useful in a wider spectrum of game development. So it, um, almost nothing here would be completely resigned to roguelikes because all it really is is a presentation session for your game. Um, your map generation algorithm just gives you data and how you use that data determines what kind of game you have. So that's the critical thing to, to realize and keep in mind when you're looking at algorithms and stuff. Learning the algorithms is the important part so that then you can use it as a tool to get what you need for your game. You say, well, this algorithm would be good for this thing or that thing that I'm trying to do. So that's why this is really interesting to me. So first we're gonna refactor the builder and define an interface. So up until now, all of our map generation code has sat in the map.rs file. Well, that's fine for a single style, but what if we want to have lots of styles? This is the perfect time to create a proper builder system. If you look at the map generation code in main.rs, we have the beginnings of an interface defined. We call map new, uh, new map rooms and corridors, which builds a set of rooms. We pass that to spawn or spawn room to populate each room, and then we place the player in the first room. So to better organize our code, we're going to make a module. Rust lets you make a directory with a file in it called mod.rs, and that directory is now a module. This is something I talked about a little while back, um, just an aside from the tutorial. This is something I talked about a while back, that we're getting a lot of files in there, and it would be nice to do some reorganization. And I even mentioned that we may be doing it here, and it looks like this is it. So modules are exposed through mod and pub mod, and provide a way to keep parts of your code together. The mod.rs file provides an interface that is a list of what is provided by the module and how to interact with it. 
Other files in the module can do whatever they want, safely isolated from the rest of the code. So we're going to create a directory off of source called map builders. In that directory, we'll create an empty file called mod.rs. And we're trying to define an interface, so we'll start with the skeleton. Um, what does it mean off of SRC? I'm not sure. Does that mean at the same level as SRC? Or does that mean at um, within SRC? Let's see. I'm going to double check the, uh, the code from the, uh, the repo. Just to be sure, 23 generic map. Yeah, it's in it's in SRC. Okay, yeah, that off of SRC wording is a little confusing to me. So we're gonna make that folder and we're gonna put mod.rs inside of there. Also, do why is this blowing up? What's going on? Okay, don't mean to get distracted, but it's just weird. Um, let me try making a folder here if I can create mm, folder new direct mm. <laughs> I don't know how file I, I don't know if I can I, I mean there may be a command but none of the searches I've done seem to work so in source we're going to do new folder and map builders I think let me double check in here. Map builders. And we're going to need mod.rs inside of that. So, new file, mod.rs. All right, no. So, I'll have to get used to some of the things I can do with the command palette. I might need to add some extensions if I want to get more functionality. But, you know, it's a start. It is a start. So, use super map. Great map builder. And this is our skeleton, huh? So we're going to return a map. Um, this is a trait. So what we're doing, I don't think we've defined any traits ourselves yet in the tutorial. So a little aside on that. This is a lot like, you know, an interface or something in Java. We're essentially defining a contract that anything that implements the trait map builder has to have a function called build that takes a i32 called new depth it doesn't really matter what you call it i guess but um a name's a name right it's an identifier and it returns map so we could implement that for anything we could impl map builder for string and it's going to be it should be angry Mm, or not. Oh, I know why. Because we're not using it yet. So we're going to go into main. I'm going to add this real quick. So pub mod uh, map builders. And I think, yeah. Not all trait items have been implemented, so we're missing build. We'll implement that. And then we can theoretically make a map out of a string, or we can, you know, we actually have to build a map for it, but uh, we could do this for anything, right? We could do this for a vec of um, i32 string um, hash map. Like we could put all like a weird tuple in the vec and like that's our, we can make a map out of that if we want. Point is, uh, we can implement that for really anything uh, as long as we abide by that contract and do the build method there, the build function there. All right. The use of trait is new. A trait's like an interface in other languages. You're saying that any other type can implement the trait and then be treated as a variable of that type. Rust by example has a great section on traits, as does the Rust book. What we're stating is that anything can declare itself to be a map builder, and that includes a promise that they will build that they will provide a build function that takes in an ECS world object and returns a map. Um as a little, little bit of a typo there. The function is taking in an i32 in both of these instances. It's not taking in an ECS world object. But that's okay. Um, just calling that out. So we're going to open up map.rs and add a new function called, appropriately enough, new. 
Alrighty, so let's see if I could do this here. So we're going to go here, map.rs. And... Are we going to put it on an impl? No, we're just going to plop it in here. So we're going to say pub, um, let's see, generates and empty map consisting uh, entirely of solid walls. So I think what we might be doing here is carving out a little bit. Um, we might be generating, this is just guesses for now, but we're probably going to generate a solid map and then carve out the pieces that actually represent the final map that we want to have. Let me double check one thing here. All right. Sorry about that. So it's going to be a public... Oops. Not, not another comment line. Pub. FN new. New depth. I32. It's going to return a map. And it's going to be a map with a bunch of fields. This is not going to be super exciting yet, but it's going to be a new vec with tile type wall for map count. So we're filling the vec. Rooms are going to be a vec new. Um, width is going to be map width as I32. Height, guess what it's going to be? Map width as I30. No, it's map height, of course. <laughs> it's a joke. Vec, false map count. I like the idea of someone just like putting this on on the side while they're working on something. And they're like, did he just say height is map width? <laughs> Visible tiles, false map count. So basically, we're saying nothing is revealed, nothing is visible yet. Um, vec false map count nothing is blocked yet um, tile, ooh okay, they came in in a different order on my end so let me scooch this around alright, depth, new depth Bloodstains, hash set, new. All right, I think I made everything happy, so let me verify. Um, actually, an easy way to verify, and I could have just did this since it's boilerplate, but paste over it. Just to make sure I didn't mistype something there, but it's a map. I don't think I need to break down. It's, we're, it's a struct, it's a map. Um, we're setting everything to like false and, you know, empty vex and, you know, that kind of stuff. The most important one is what we already said. It's full of walls, nothing else. So, we'll need this for other map genera uh, generators, and it makes sense for a map to know how to return a new one as a constructor without having to encapsulate all the logic for map layout. The idea is that any map will work basically the same way, irrespective of how we've decided to populate it. Now we'll create a new file also inside the map builder's directory. We'll call it simplemap.rs, and it'll be where we put the existing map generation. We'll also put a skeleton in place here. So let me go into that directory and new file it. Um, what's it called again? Simple map.rs. I imagine we're going to rip out a lot of the logic from uh, that other, the maps.rs, and then we're going to put it in here maybe. We'll see. So we're going to use super map builder, use super map. Use specs prelude star obstruct simple map builder. So it actually has nothing in it. Um, again, this is very. Oh, whoops. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. You're not missing anything. Um, it's the same thing that was on the screen. I just realized I didn't uh, deactivate the browser though. Simple map builder being a, uh, a struct with nothing in it. We've seen that plenty of times with like uh, systems and all and components and all. Super common in Rust is just basically a placeholder where you can define some logic if you don't actually need data. 
So we're gonna do map builder for simple map builder. And if I try to save this, we're not using it anywhere. So it's not gonna be happy at the moment. Um, we're gonna have to use this somewhere. Or that's not what I'm trying to say. It is happy, at least it appears to be happy. Um, if we were using this somewhere, we would see what we saw earlier, that this is going to complain because we're not actually implementing the uh, the function build new depth i32. I wonder if you can change that name there. Be interesting. New new depth. All right, so just build that solid map. Nothing special. Simple map builder. All right, and this simply returns an unusable solid map. We'll flesh out the details in a bit. So let's get the interface working first. Now back in map builders mod RS, we had a public function. For now, it just calls the builder in simple map builder. So, um, where's it at? Mod.rs, yeah. Okay. Pub function, build random map, new depth, I32, map, and simple map builder, build new depth. So we'll tell main to actually include the module. So pub mod map builders, we already did that. And this is not, yeah, it's not going to be happy. So we're going to have to use that here. Um, use simple, uh, how do we get this to resolve? That one I'm not sure about simple map builder. Let's make sure I didn't typo it. It's not finding it. We can't seem to use it here. Mod simple map. Yeah. Use simple map star. There we go. It's just like in main. Okay, yeah, it's just like in main. We need to bring it in here. It was not mentioned in the tutorial, however, that I can see. Okay, so in main, we already did um, map builders, pub mod map builders. We have some things that are mad in here. You know what? I think this was part of the impl. It's just not a, it's a, Yeah, that should have been in, in the map block. That's why things were mad, because we did map double colon new. Um, I didn't, I was thinking it could have been a public function from within this maps dot, or map.rs file, but no, it's actually public function from the map impl. Okay, and that's how we were calling it. If we go back over here, we did map new. That's one way you could tell. Um, it's just initially I didn't have the context clue of where to put it. Uh, I didn't know how we were using it, and then we see that it got mad. So there we go. All right. So that was a fair amount of work to not actually do anything, but we've gained a clean interface offering map creation via a single function and set up a trait to require that our map builders work in a similar fashion. It's a good start. So flushing out the simple map builder, and we start by moving functionality out of map rs into our simple map builder. We'll start by adding another file to map builders, common.rs. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So we just need common.rs, which I meant to, I need to close the uh, explorer when I'm not using it. I like the feel of doing that, but I'm not used to it. So it's gonna take some time to get used to it um, as a new workflow. Um, but this will hold functions that used to be part of the map and are now commonly used when building. So let's go ahead and work on this file. Cheat to get some imports. We're going to use map, rect, and tile type. We're going to use standard compare, max, and min. Now, what we have in here is apply room to map, apply horizontal tunnel, and apply vertical tunnel, which, guess what, are all in here. So I'm gonna go line by line and make sure we're good. Um, but 
we should be able to just paste these in, make them public. So I'm going to get my cursor there, alt-click there, and alt-click there to have three cursors, and then do pub in front of each. Now, this no longer takes mute self and all that, and we would actually be getting an error if, um, if we were using common somewhere. So we probably need to use common. Let's see. I'm just checking one thing. The pub function means they're within the module, unless we had a pub not mentioned. Okay, we're fine. I'm gonna go up to the mod here and do mod common just to get that um, syntax highlighting and stuff working in here. Um, now it's interesting that rect and stuff is not working. Hmm, I wonder why that is. The first thing I want to tackle though is these um, selfs because we're not actually doing like a um, an impl block or something so we do need to get rid of those so it's gonna change how this works a little bit let's get rid of those and what we're gonna be looking at here is um, we're gonna pass in the map so it's map and mute map and everything else should mostly be the same so map and mute map and down here, I could have made the triple cursor again, but it's fine. And then we probably just need to take every single use of the word self and plop map over it, just like that. Because it's no longer within the actual map impl. So everything's happy there. Again, I'm wondering why rect and tile type are not found. Is this looking for map builders? So map is in map builders, but um, those are not. So we need to say use super map rect tile type. I don't have too much experience building out like these kinds of sub modules and stuff. So I'm figuring this out as I go, but um, that seems a little bit boilerplate-y. I don't know how I feel about that. So we'll see if there's a, a good way to keep this organized because I don't like adding it in two places. Can I do... Use super... Super... Map... Rect... Um, what was another one that was out there? Um... um Wants to draw, yeah. So I could do super, super. So it's not very nice looking either, but um, just a thought. Okay. So we've made this happy now. We've um, replaced self with this map and mute map because we're actually taking a map and modifying it now to apply the the rooms and apply the tunnels and all that stuff. That's cool. Um. Let's take a look at the tutorial. These are the exactly the same as the functions from map.rs, but with map passed as mutable references, so you're working on the original rather than a new one. And all vestiges of self are gone. These are free functions, that is, they are functions available from anywhere, not tied to a type. That's why we called it common. It's not a common map, it's common functions for map generation or for the module. Okay. Um, the pub function means they're public within the module unless we add pub used to the module itself. They aren't passed out of the module to the main program. This helps keep, yeah, this helps keep code organized. Now that we have these helpers, we could start porting the map builder itself. In simple map.rs, we start by fleshing out the build function a bit. All right, so let's head back over to simple map. And um, what are we gonna do? So we have the um, builder here where we make a new map, but that's not really exciting. Let mute map equal map new, new depth. So we're keeping the same line, but we're actually storing it as a local variable so we can then modify it, we can work on it. Simple map builder, rooms, and 
corridors and mute map map now it's complaining because it doesn't know about that um so we're calling a new function rooms and corridors so let's build it okay i was like should we have that or not there's not one in here right we have new map rooms and corridors so it's going to be very similar um probably a lot of the functionality is going to be the same so looking at the tutorial we have const max rooms min size max size um we get an rng for i and zero to max rooms we do whxy just like this min size max size min size max size we're going to roll dice one map width minus w minus one minus one yep map height minus h minus one minus one same thing let new room equal rect new x y w h let mute okay equal true for other room in map dot rooms dot iter if new room dot intersect other room okay is false and we have if okay i'm yeah i'm seeing this is almost exactly the same um, this is somewhere I made a little bit of a change before. Instead of storing this OK variable and doing it this way, I used um, on the iter, you can do um, all. And you can enforce that none of them intersect. Uh, or I had to think about the logic again. That doesn't sound right. Um, what's happening here? If a room intersects, OK is false. So you could say any and give it a closure and then check for intersection um, and then if one does intersect well, you'd, you'd have to like negate it it's weird all right i'm not going to get down the tangent it's not it's not difficult but it's it's weird not typing in trying to explain it i did it before you have to go way back but i think it's a little nicer and it's a little more um idiomatic and friendly than i mean this is probably <laughs> maybe more friendly to a, a newer programmer, especially if you're coming from a C or something. But um, I really like the use of those functions like any and all. So any just says if any element of the iterator matches a predicate, um, it gives true. Or you could do all. I think you would want to do all here. And then the first one that actually does intersect, you would short circuit. So I think that's how you would want to set that up. Anyway, getting sidetracked there. So if OK, um, map.apply room to map. So there is a difference here. This has map in it. So where does this end? It ends at map tiles. OK, so this all the way through this is what we need. So we're going to go to simple maps. Uh, not simple map, is it? Oh, it is, yeah. Okay. Impl simple map builder. And we're going to say function rooms and corridors. And it's going to take map and mute map. We're going to pass this in here. Now, it's a little freaked out by some of this because we were calling these in a way that we no longer can. So we'll do some of that to make it happy. Um, we don't have rect up here, so we're going to have to bring in rect. All right. And I guess we're going to have to bring in common as well. Um, Common is already in mods, right? Yeah, so... I guess we just say use com super common? Okay, so I could put common in here. Right? Yeah, okay. So now some of this should be happy. We're going to have to do a little bit more work with it, like past the map.
and map, new room. Now almost everything is happy. So we need the random number generator. I think the way I'd want to do that is, um, does that not come in through? No, it's not specs, it's RLTK, yeah. We'll just bring that in directly here for now. Um, there might be a better way to do that at some point, but it's good enough for now. Okay, so everything except for this is happy. We don't have tile type, which comes in from here as well. It can. I'll have to see how they did it. All right, so I think pretty much everything is the same. Um, Code-wise, map.rooms.push. What stairs position? Yeah, I think all that's similar. So what I, I mean, what I did is I looked at the tutorial code. It didn't tell me exactly where it was from, but because we wrote the code, I was like, you know, I recognize what we're doing. The name is similar to something we have. Let's go see what we already have. And it's pretty much the same thing. If you take a look at my code here, you saw me copy it from maps.rs, new rooms and corridor, new map rooms and corridors. You saw me copy it, but now if we flip over to the browser, you can see it's like the same code. So no real difference here. Um, the main thing was we had to add this map that we're now passing around, this mutable reference to a map that we're modifying. So that's all that's really different here. Um, again, for sanity, since I did copy paste, yeah, I don't think a single thing changed. I just copied their code, pasted over mine. I don't think a single thing changed. That saved me from having to type it out. At this point, the time it took, it might have been about equal, but that's okay. So back to the um, tutorial side here. Refactoring typically is a lot of copy pasting. There's no shame in that on refactoring. Copy from one place, paste in another, like, you know, whatever. All right, you'll notice that this is a, this is built as a method attached to the simple map builder structure. It isn't part of the trait, so we can't define it there, but we want to keep it separated from other builders, which might have their own functions. The code itself should look eerily familiar. It's the same as the generator in map.rs, but with map as a variable rather than being generated inside the function. This is only the first half of generation, but it's a good start. So go to map.rs and delete the entire new map rooms and corridors function. All right, you don't have to, wait, why is this mad? Uh-oh. Hold on. Why is this mad? Simple, simple map builder. Why not? Cargo build. Oh, yeah, I should have done release. Obstruct, they don't have it. They don't have the function. Yeah, that's not typoed or anything. What am I missing? Simple map builder rooms and corridors. Oh, I did make a typo, didn't I? Yeah. Okay, it's just hard to see. Ah, sorry. There we go. All right, we're happy now. All right, I was gonna say you don't have to see me delete this, but now that we're here, you can see me delete it. I was like, wait a minute, we have red. All right, delete new maps, rooms and new map rooms and corridors. We're done with you. Bye. Now we're gonna get some red because main and stuff is still using it, but that's expected. So no issue there yet. It's going to be like, no function called that. Well, that's fine. All right, back to the tutorial side now. Um, where were we at? Delete it. Also delete the ones we replicated in common.rs. All right, so back in maps.rs here, I'm going to delete apply room to map and apply vertical and horizontal tunnel. You don't have to see me do that. That's Deleting is very easy. <laughs> All right. The map.rs file looks much cleaner now without any references to map building strategy. 
Of course, your compiler slash IDE is probably telling you that we've broken a bunch of stuff, but that's okay in a normal part of refactoring, the process of changing code to be easier to work with. There are three lines in main that are now flagged by the compiler. We can replace world map resource. Okay, well, yeah, let's probably go into main and, and look at these ourselves now. So back to VS Code. World map resource, map, new map rooms and corridors, current depth. We're going to be saying, um, what are we going to do here? Map builders build random map current depth plus one. That's all there is to it. Okay. One thing. Oh, right. That actually generates a map. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. We're not modifying our map. We're generating a new one. Okay. So um, next, this line here, world map resource equal uh, map, new map rooms and corridors one. It's going to be the same thing, right? Map, builders, new, um, oh, that was it. Build random... What in the world just happened? I didn't press anything that would have auto-completed that. Weird. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. I think we're going to do the same thing again. So let's find this last part where it's complaining. We make a map at, at one here. We're just going to plop that on there. All right. So if we cargo run, we'll notice the game is exactly the same. <laughs> we're going to do cargo run release. Take a moment, I'm going to get a drink. And if I begin new game, everything works fine. I was going to say, if we could find some stairs, everything still works fine. That's all there is to see. As the tutorial says, the game will be exactly the same. That's good. We've successfully refactored functionality out of map and into map builders. Now we're going to place the player. If we look in main.rs, pretty much every time we build a map, we then look for the first room and use it to place the player. It's quite possible that we won't want to use that st uh, same strategy in the future maps, so we should indicate where the player goes when we build the map. Let's expand our interface in map builders mod.rs to also return a position. So we're going to say, like, uh, player location or something, I guess. That's the position that we're returning. So um, what are we going to do? Build returns map and position. Okay. Can I not do it that way? Can I do it as super position? Yeah. I don't like splitting up into two different things. Superposition, get it? Physics stuff? No. So what's fun now is this is all we really need to do here. Um, although it should be... Okay, yeah, it's it's mad somewhere else. I was going to say it should be mad. This is all we need to do here. And we're going to make build also return that position. So notice we're using a tuple to return two values at once. We've talked about them earlier, but this is a great example of why they're useful. And we now need to go into simple map and make the build function actually return the correct data. The definition of build in simple map.rs now looks like this. So we're going to return a tuple with position in it. Um, where be it here? And we'll probably have to pull in position right here. And what are we actually going to get the position from or yeah what are we going to do with the position so we're going to get it from this let player position um, pause it doesn't matter equal rooms and corridors now we're shifting the responsibility further and further down the line so you know if you're following along you're saying oh yeah that makes sense but rooms and corridors doesn't return a position either so, see how it's, it's actually showing a problem here, because in Rust, 
when something like doesn't return anything, it, it's this empty tuple. It's called the unit type. So it thinks that we're trying to return map and a unit type, but we actually want a player position. So it's showing as an error here, but it's actually an error in rooms and corridors. So this is not in the tutorial, but if I wanted to force the error to change position, I would add the type position there, and now it's going to complain that rooms and corridors is not returning a position. So that's showing, you know, that's we're pushing down the line where we actually need to deal with this. So let's go over to rooms and corridors, which is right down here, actually. Um, and we're just going to make that return a position. We don't need to make it return a map because the map is passed in mutably. So there we're, we're good there. We'll add a last line to return the center of room zero. So right after the map.tiles stuff, let start position equal map dot rooms zero dot center position. And then X is start position dot X uh, dot zero. It's just a regular tuple. And then start position dot one. Okay. And then now we have a cool position struct being returned from the rooms and corridors. I, it, it works. Uh, I'm pausing for a moment to think about should it be the thing that builds the rooms and stuff? Should it be its responsibility to decide where the player goes? Should it? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It, it's... I get too wrapped up in that. Whatever. So now we go back to here, and it says, This has, of course, broken the code we updated in main. We can quickly take care of that. The first error has been taken care of, can be taken care of with the following code. Let's take a look at main. Let's see what the first error is. Let's see what's going on. Um, world map resource. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we're returning the position as well, right? So we can do... Oh, they're doing quite a bit more, huh? Oh, no, they're showing multiple lines. Yeah, let current depth and let player start. And then do the world map resource. Current depth is the depth. And then let new map start equal. And this is map builders stuff. Um, yep, and then world map resources new map and player start equals start. Shift those things around a little bit. We're good. Spawn bad guys, they're showing that. Yeah, so instead of using this here, we want to use the player start. dot x and player start dot y okay we're kind of just shifting this data along it's an interesting way to do it. we could unless i'm missing something we could re you we could just change all these player x and y's to use player start but this is a quicker way to get that data shifted along and it doesn't hurt anything Okay, and then let's make sure for room in world map dot room site or dot skip one spawner spawn room. Okay, all that's good. So the tutorial says notice how we're using destructuring to retrieve both the map and the start position from the builder. We then put these in the appropriate places. Since assignment in Rust is a move operation, this is pretty efficient and the compiler can get rid of temporary assignments for us. Probably like what I was just describing with the um, with the way player start is being used. Um, we do the same thing again on the second error around line 369, almost exactly the same code, so feel free to check the source if you're stuck. And lastly, the final error can be simply replaced like this. Well, we'll take a look at it in a minute. Let's go to the second error now. Let's do this on our own. So we'll say let player start 
And here... Okay, it moved the lines and that threw me off. We're gonna copy this. Let new map... Oops. New map. And a player... Uh, and start... Well, the builder thing, and then we're gonna say new map. And then player start equal start. And now... I find this interesting. That player start is not complaining. Let me try doing a build real quick. Oh, it's still mad. Um, oops. To do, to do, to do. We'll come back to this in a moment. Um, I, I want to make a comment on something. We'll get to it in a moment. I know this is a little fracture jumping back and forth, but it'll be okay. I promise. So now for the last one, um, let map and player start. We'll get rid of our type here. And player X, player Y, instead of using the center. Alrighty, cool. Yeah, nothing else changes. So we are good to go there. Now, back up on the to-do comment. There we go. That's what I was waiting on. It wasn't showing me this because we were uh, we had errors down below. But um, so that threw me off because I was going to make the comment. We sh we now need to use player start um, right here because it's complaining that we're assigning to it, but we're not actually doing anything with it. Copied the name of that so I could get through that quicker. All right. So, the tutorial says, all right, let's cargo run that puppy. If all went well, then nothing has changed. We made a significant gain, however. Our map building strategy now determines the player's starting point on a level, not the map itself. So let's do a cargo run release. And three, two, one. Nope, there we are. Sometimes it takes a moment. Begin new game. I mean, yeah, nothing's changed. We're just shifting the logic around. This is what refactoring is at its heart, right? Refactoring means you, you don't really change the functionality of the code. You make it smarter, though. That's what you're really doing. You're making the logic, the organization of the logic smarter. That's what I would say refactoring is. Um, there's some different rules around refactoring, rules of thumb and such, if you will. One of the ones that I learned early on in my career was um, the rule of three, where, you know, if you're writing something once, it's okay. If you're writing it twice, still let it go. If you have to write the same thing three times, you should really be thinking about refactoring it. It's not, a, it's a rule of thumb. It's not a requirement, but it's a simple rule of thumb for refactoring, where when you see the same code being duplicated multiple times, there's a case for refactoring there because that could be a function, a reusable piece of code. It makes your entire code base smaller. It makes it easier to follow what's happening. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a, a pretty nice rule of thumb. It's, you know, guided me well in the past, but there can be cases to not do it as well sometimes. I mean, again, it's case by case basis. Okay. So nothing changed. We got what we wanted. So now we're going to clean up room spawning. It's quite possible that we won't have the concept of rooms in some map designs. So we also want to move spawning to be a function of the map builder. I love it. We'll add a generic spawner to the interface in map builders mod RS. I love everything about that. Um, so trait map builder, we're going to do build. And then spawn map. Oh, whoops. Spawn. And it takes a just a map reference, ECS, and new world, new depth, I32. And this is going to complain a little bit because we don't have the world in here. Bring that in. And not all traits are implemented because, well, that's how it is. So let's go ahead and uh, take care of that here in a moment. The tutorial says, simple enough, it requires the ECS since we're adding entities in the map. 
We'll also add a public function spawn to provide an external interface to lay out the monsters. So we're actually going to add this, this function here. So pub fn spawn. And it takes map and mute map ECS and mute world new depth i32. This is a public function. This is like the yeah, the external interface. This is what everybody gets to call. And then I guess this goes down. Yeah, this is going to end up going like applying to whichever map it needs to apply to. Uh, or how do I want to say it? Different maps can have their own spawning logic, but they all need to abide by this trait, by this contract, this, this um, spawn function here. So we can then pass this data along and, and use it to spawn on any map that we want to. So cool. Simple map builder spawn. And none of that really needs to change. All right. So this is just for the simple map builder though. So we're gonna have to do this for like all of the maps, all the different map types as we go on. Um, so now we're gonna go to simple map.rs and we have to actually impl this. So we could be lazy about it, implement missing members. And what are we gonna do for room in map.rooms.iter skip one spawner spawn room ECS room one boom now we don't know what spawner is here so we're gonna have to bring that in can we get to it from here yeah we can mm, maybe not Super spawner. We could do it that way. We are doing super super there, but it, it gets us access to it. Yeah, some of the organization on that gets a little bit iffy, I guess. It's still better than Java. <laughs> it's a lot better than Java. Java imports are so long because they're like all fully qualified paths and they always go like multiple layers deep. Like import com dot org dot spring dot java dot boot dot iter dot it just keeps going and going it's like why why it's so much okay so this is spawn this is it we spawn room for each room there's really nothing else we have to do there so we can go to main.rs and find every time we loop through calling spawn room and replace it with the call to map builder spawn and once again we cargo run and we're good so spawn room we only had it like three times so how is this going to look? Map, builders, spawn, and mute map, ECS, and new depth. Um, GS.ECS. This is going to be one. That's going to be a reference too, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's mutable because we're adding things, right? Uh, Cannot borrow map as mutable because it's not declared. There it is. Let mute map. We'll get to that point. It's also borrowed as immutable. Um, oof. Yeah, I see. Oh. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. The, we're, we're duplicating logic. We're spawning twice for rooms. That's all we need. I was like, wait a minute. I see what's going on here. We do need to make the map mutable, though. All right, so where else do we go? Spawn room. Current depth plus one is what I care about. Because that's going to be different. Um, expected value found. It's world map, isn't it? We need to make it mutable here. And we also need to actually use the world, which is self.ecs. 
Yeah, and then like I said, we need to make this mutable here. A little bit of boilerplate, but not too bad. Not really boilerplate, I guess. All right, let's plop this here and then take a look at everything. All right, this is a depth of one. Nothing else should matter. Okay, there we are. So now we're going to cargo run and we'll have the same game we've been looking at for 22 chapters according to the tutorial here. Let's find out if I didn't break anything. Double check OBS, making sure we're looking at what we're supposed to be looking at. Begin new game. All right, we're spawning. Took a moment to find anything, but we're spawning items. We got our stairs. Um, we got our enemies. I want to die and have it build a new map. There we are. Okay, sweet. In just a second here. Alrighty. So, like I just said, we're looking at the same game we've been looking at for 22 chapters. That's how refactoring is, right? Oops, I hit the wrong button. So, maintaining builder's state. If you look closely at what we have so far, there's one problem. The builder has no way of knowing what should be used for the second call to the builder, spawning things. That's because our functions are stateless. We don't actually create a builder and give it a way to remember anything. Since we want to support a wide variety of builders, we should correct that. This introduces a new Rust concept called Dynamic Dispatch. The Rust book has a good section on this if you're familiar with the concept. If you've previously used an object-oriented programming language, you'll have encountered this also. The basic idea is that you have a base object that specifies an interface, and multiple objects implement the functions from the interface. You can then, at runtime, when the program runs rather than when it compiles, put any object that implements the interface into a variable typed by the interface. Um, we're going to see this probably dying and stuff come up. And uh, we did this in the other. Um, did we do it? No, we didn't do this in the other roguelike tutorial. We did this in the ECS building or Babby ECS tutorial before the last roguelike tutorial. It's on YouTube. Um, we did some stuff like this. We're going to see how it, it, it plays out here. Um, but this is, gonna, this is kind of what I was alluding to, where each different type of map is going to have to be able to do this. And we're basically going to say, I have a builder, figure out how to build whatever I need in this case. Um, so yeah, multi, uh, we have a base object that specifies an interface. Multiple objects implement the functions from the interface. At runtime, we can put any object that implements that into a variable type by the interface. And when you call the methods from the interface, the implementation runs from the actual type. This is nice because your underlying program doesn't have to know about the actual implementations, just how to talk to the interface. That helps keep your program clean. Now this is the point of, like, this is where things like traits and stuff matter. Um, or, well, no, it, it depends. Traits have different uses, but this is one of the places where traits really, you know, come into play and where they really help by allowing multiple things to be able to all define that trait, uh, implement that trait, rather. And then you, your, your program's just like, all right, I don't care what this is, as long as it, you know, abides by the trait, like, we're cool, right? So dynamic dispatch does come with a cost, which is why an entity, which is why entity component systems and Rust in general prefer not to use it for performance-critical code. There's actually two costs. I believe one of them is that the way Rust does it, is it monom um, monomorphism stuff? Uh, we'll, we'll see if it's described here, but I believe one of the things that's associated with this is that Rust actually generates um, specific code for every single way that it's used, and that blows up your binaries a bit and stuff, but you know, we'll, we'll see. 
So the first cost, the first problem is since you don't know what type the object is up front, you have to allocate it via a pointer. Rust makes this easy by providing the box system, more on that in a moment, but there is a cost. Rather than just jumping to a readily defined piece of memory, which your CPU memory can, CPU slash memory can generally figure out easily in advance and make sure the cache is ready, the code has to follow the pointer and then run what it finds at the end of the pointer. That's why some C++ programmers call the arrow thing, the dereference operator, the cache miss operator. Simply by being boxed, your code is slowed down by a tiny amount. And since multiple types can implement methods, the computer needs to know which one to run. It does this with a vtable, that is, a virtual table of method implementations. So each call has to check the table, find out which method to run, and then run from there. That's another cache miss and more time for your CPU to figure out what to do. So yeah, let's, let's drill back down on that one more time. Since multiple types can implement methods, the computer needs to know which one to run. And it uses a vtable. So it literally is a lookup on that table to say, which one of these do I need? That's basically what's going on. In this case, we're just generating the map and making very few calls into the builder. So this makes the slowdown acceptable since it's really small and not being run frequently. You wouldn't want to do this in your main loop if you can avoid it. Yeah, so a little personal aside here, just uh, elaborating on what's being said. Uh, you hear things like the main loop in this case, you might hear it being referred to as like a hot loop or some like hot piece of the code is a piece of code that gets ran over and over and over again quite a lot. And a small performance impact in a hot piece of code can actually, you know, really mean something for your overall performance. It can add up. So that's where it kind of matters. But um, the point here is that you generate the map and then you run around the map for, you know, a couple minutes or something, or, you, you know, even like 30 seconds or whatever but you're only calling it once for that entire time. So a tiny fractional, tiny, tiny bit, Yeah, you know, it's probably less than a millisecond. It's probably even less than a microsecond, I would imagine. So in that case, it's not a big deal. But you know, if you're at, if you're doing this stuff over and over and over again in a really hot loop, you know, you might have some issues. I mean, we'd have to benchmark it to find out how long it really takes, but it's not worth it. Um, so implementation, we'll start by changing our trait to be public. We have the methods accept a mute self, which means this method is a member of the trait and should receive access to self, the attached object when we call it. Let's get over there and do that. Um, where is it, map.mods? Yeah, so now it's a pub trait map builder. Expected bang. No, we're good. <laughs> okay. And these go from this to and mute self. Um, and and mute self. And they, everything else should remain the same. But now we're going to copy and mute self so I can quickly plop these in here as well. Oh no, the spawn, that's our public interface. I think we can leave those. No, we are going to have to, okay, we'll, we'll see how this is, is handled because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a moment. Okay, so we're just going to make that change. I'm not going to try and get ahead of myself here. Um, yeah, so the impl, the impuls are not doing this yet. We're going to have a lot of red until we deal with it, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. Notice that I've also taken the time to make the names. Oh, he did change the names. Let me fix that. Hang on. So it's now, I'm going to refactor and say build map. And here I'm going to refactor and say spawn entities. That way I don't have to do it all over the place. Alrighty. Taking the time to make the names a bit more descriptive. Now we replace our free function calls with a factory function. It creates a map builder and returns it. The name is a bit of a lie until we have more map implementations. It claims to be random, but when there's only one choice, it's not hard to guess which one it'll pick. Just ask Soviet election systems, okay. Um, public function random builder. Okay, so we're getting rid of the... Okay, yeah, let's see how this works. Let's put this into place. So we're just gonna plop it down here, pub fn random 
builder box dine map builder so we haven't really seen boxes at all in this but they're, they're just a really basic they're probably the most basic kind of smart pointer we have a, a few others i'll mention here in a moment note that we until we have a second oh my god it's gonna bother me until i fix that so we have a second map type this isn't even slightly random box new simple map builder boom so simple map builder implements map builder that's why we can say um this dine thing and i think i mentioned a minute ago that we're probably going to see dine if i didn't hear it is but um the moment i was like dynamic dispatch and stuff i was like yeah we're going to see dine here in a moment so dine is a keyword that basically says it's a trait object so if we look here dine is a prefix of a trait object's type the dine keyword is used to highlight that calls to methods in the associated trait are dynamically dispatched to use the trait this way it must be object safe unlike generic parameters or impl trait the compiler does not know the concrete type that's being passed that is the type has been erased as such a dine trait reference contains two pointers one pointer goes to the data an instance of the struct example an instance of a struct another pointer goes to a map of method call names to function pointers known as a virtual method table or v table at runtime when a method needs to be called on the dine trait the v table is consulted to get the function pointer and then that function pointer is called so this is what we were just reading about in the tutorial but this is from the rust docs here so there are some trade-offs that we can look at um, the above indirection is the is the additional runtime cost of calling a function on a dine trait Methods called by dynamic dispatch generally cannot be inlined by the compiler. However, dyn trait is likely to produce smaller code than impl trait slash generic parameters as the method won't be duplicated for each con... Okay, so I made a mistake. The method won't be duplicated for each concrete type. So that's what happens if you do impl trait or you do generics, it actually has to generate individual like imp functions for every single way it's being used. And then that blows up your binary a bit. But this is done. This is handled in a different way. Okay, so I scratch that little mistake I made earlier. This will not blow up your binary and make it larger, but the generics and impuls can, and potentially will. But it's not that they're bad, right? You have to you have to look at a lot of things and and make a lot of considerations when you're writing code. If you really care about optimizations and file size, you know, binary size, you, you can get into more of that. All right. So anyway, um, so let's see, give me a second. Now we replace our free function calls with a factory function. So the one that gets us a, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not gonna replace anything yet. Let's Let's keep going. Not sure which calls we're, we're referring to, if I'm being honest, yet. But random builder. I'm gonna stop. Stop going down that rabbit hole. If I, if I need to double check something, I will. Let's keep moving on. So this is all we've done, right? Um, Notice that it doesn't return a map builder, rather it returns a box dine map builder. Oh yeah, that's actually, hang, let me go down that aside real quick. Um, box dine map builder, so box, as I said, is one of the types of uh, smart pointers in Rust. A pointer type for heap allocation. Kind of the most simple one. We have cow as well, which is clone on, <laughs> it's a funny name, but clone on write smart pointer. It provides clone on write functionality, it can enclose and provide immutable access to borrowed data and clone the data lazily when mutation or ownership is required. The type is designed to work with general borrowed data via the borrow trait. I'm not going to keep reading on that one. We have another one, which this would be, if you've done a lot of C++ with smart pointers, this will be familiar. We have RC, which is a single threaded reference counting pointer. This would be shared pointer, shared PTR in uh, C++. And basically, um, the way a reference counted pointer works is that um, you can have a bunch of different references to the same thing and 
this lives for as long as the reference counting stays above zero. So basically when you put, it's like a container, the way it's implemented in Rust, it's a container and you put something in it, and then every time you clone that RC container, you're incrementing that counter, and then you're handing off like the, that RC to whoever needs it, and then every time you clone that, every time that, that that counter goes up, and then one of those goes out of scope, the counter goes back down by one, and then eventually, somewhere in your code, the last one goes out of scope, the counter hits zero, it all gets deallocated, it's gone. Um, so that's pretty useful. Um, it's really good if you need some shared, you know, some shared data. But one that's really good is when you get into threading, you have arc, which is basically the same thing, but it's atomically reference counted. And atomics are another type of variables which are thread safe. So if you can deduce from that, atomically reference counted is a thread safe reference counted pointer. So it provides shared ownership of the value of type T, allocating the heap, invoking clone on arc produces a new arc instance, which points to the same allocation as the source arc, while increasing a reference count. When the last arc pointer to a given location is destroyed, the value stored in that allocation, often referred to as inner value, is also dropped. Shared references in Rust disallow mutation by default, and arc is no exception. You cannot generally obtain a mutable reference to something inside an arc. If you need to mutate through an arc, use mutex, rwlock, or one of the atomic types. So this is where it actually gets interesting, um, because what you typically see, if you're doing something like that, you'll see code that looks more like um, arc mutex um, my struct. Well, I mean, we could make it more relevant here and say map builder or whatever, right? So we've got. A, um, hold on. So we have an arc, an atomically reference counted pointer to a mutex with a map builder in it. So then you can actually, every time you clone that arc, you're increasing the, the, the count, but then you can share that across threads. You can hand that over to another thread, and then that gets you access to the mutex, which you could then lock and actually use the map builder in different threads safely. So it's it's kind of cool. You end up seeing a lot of stuff like this, arc mutex, something inside of there. Um, but you can do that with like a regular RC. You could do RC or, you know, you could put like whatever you want in there, really. Um, it's just, that's what you see a lot when you start getting into threading stuff is that arc mutex and then a thing that's a pretty common pattern. Because um, the mutex itself can't actually be sent across threads. It doesn't uh, implement send and sync I don't think I don't believe it does but if we look yeah so here in the mutex example arc mutex and then they put a number inside of it an int of some kind a u size whatever it is um, the oops no mutex guard the other one there's something similar rw lock is kind of like a mutex but it's a little bit different um you also have like cell and ref cell which are i don't know if they're actually um pointers i don't think they they might not be but they work similarly to what we were just talking about um but they can ref cell in particular um can be pretty powerful you can do this thing called internal mutability we're not going to get into that here i'm going down a tangent to <laughs> it was just you know, fun to think about real quick because there's a lot of different types of smart pointers and the ways they can be used can get you some really good behaviors here in Rust. What is cool though is if you try to send an RC arc, or if you try to send an RC uh, mutex something across threads, it actually fail. RC does not implement send and sync. It is not thread safe. So you you will at compile time fail because it's not a thread safe thing to do. So that's actually really nice about Rust that it can detect these threading related issues, not just like the regular like borrowing and stuff that you see here in single threaded applications, because that's already really great. But it's like now we can get these multi threading guarantees that other languages don't necessarily provide us. All right, enough of that. 
So um, we don't return a map builder, rather we return a box dine map builder. It's rather convoluted. In earlier versions of Rust, the dine is optional. A box is a type wrapped in a pointer whose size may not be known at compile time. It's the same as C++ map builder star. Yeah, literally just like a pointer. Um, it points to a map builder rather than actually being one. The dine is a flag to say this should use dynamic dispatch. The code will work without it, it will be inferred, but it's good practice to flag that you're doing something complicated slash expensive here. The function simply returns box new simple map builder. This is actually two calls now. We make a box with box new and we place an empty simple map builder into the box. Over in main, we once again have to change all three calls to the map builder. We now need to use the following pattern. Obtain a boxed map builder, call build map as a method, and call spawn entities also as a method. So the implementation from go to next level will now read as follows, and we'll go ahead and do that. All right. So let's ignore this for a minute here, um, because we still haven't made everything happy yet. Let's ignore some of that being mad, and let's go to main. Actually. We haven't fixed those issues though, and it bothers me because I'm not seeing it yet in the tutorial. So in here, you know what, let's do it, and mute self, and mute self. Okay, so far that's happy, but we're not using it. So I'm missing something, we're not using it yet. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. All right. Um, so, give me a moment. Build map as a method, which is there. So do we even need these anymore? I think we do. I see. We don't need that at all, do we? Main is going to be mad, but I don't think we need that at all now. I see what's happening. That's the point of what we just did here. These were a publicly exposed interface, but now because it's all using the dying keyword here, and it's all trait-based. We don't need to expose that interface because we know anything that we're working with is going to um, satisfy that. So go to next level. Where are we at? Let's find go to next level. Right here. Okay, so spawn bad guys. So what are we going to do here? Um, so down here, it's going to be... We're going to go a little bit backwards here. Builder.spawn entities and world map and mute self.ecs current depth plus one. So that's going to be what we actually need, but we don't have builder. We don't know what it is yet. So we need to actually make a map builder. So what we're going to do here is let mute builder equal map builders random builder current depth uh yeah plus one did i did i miss that on the hold on yeah no <laughs> that's why i was confused Hold on, what are we doing here? That's not in the code before, so I did not make a mistake. I'm gonna get rid of that current depth plus one there. Because that makes no sense. Okay, so we get a builder, then we're gonna set up world map and all that fun stuff. Um. Current, yep, all right. New map and start. So we need current depth. 
world map resource dot depth and then we don't have build random map um let's actually build map no, why not builder dot build map let's take another look over here there is build map okay What am I missing? Let builder equal map builders, random builder, world map, current depth, player start, world map resource, that's fine, current depth, that's fine. And then we're going to say new map and start is, oh, it's, it's builder, that's what I'm missing, I'm sorry. Oh, builder dot. Yeah. I had it treated like a module still. That's on me. Okay, my bad. I hate when I do that kind of thing, when I just get lost on something. Like, I understand what's going on and what needs to be done, but then I get, like, thrown off on one little thing. Ah! <laughs> All right. So the, the tutorial says um, it's not very different, but now we're keeping the builder object around. So subsequent calls to the builder will actually apply to the same implementation, sometimes called concrete object. The object actually physically exists. If we were to add five more map builders, the code in main.rs wouldn't care. We can add them to the factory, and the rest of the program is blissfully unaware of the workings of the map builder. This is a very good example of how dynamic dispatch can be useful. You have a clearly defined interface, and the rest of the program doesn't need to understand the inner workings. I want to double check what's going on in here for a moment, though. Hmm. I feel like I'm missing something with the description here. Simple map builder. Simple map builder is just the thing in here. But we are declaring a new. We are making a new box with a new simple map builder every time we call random builder. So all three calls to the map builder, we're going to obtain a boxed map builder. All that method and spawn entities but we're not keeping it around that's what i'm not sure about they say subsequent calls to the builder will apply to the same implementation why i'm i must be missing something here and i would love to understand this okay let builder equal map builders random builder and then down here it's going to be builder dot build random map oh, no, build map we change that builder dot spawn um, entities okay I think all that's going to be happy And then down here, let builder equal map builders, random builder, builder dot build map. And then this thing needs to be builder dot spawn. Whoops. Oh, once again, spawn entities. And this needs to be um, mutable. I think I missed it above as well. I noticed it right before he got mad. I was like, wait a minute. Let's see what happens. 
if we run this. Yeah, we're good. Still building all right. I mean, we should expect that, but it's good to see. There's a lot of rations in one room there, wasn't it? All right, enemies should be... Go again. Enemies should be coming in. There we go. All right, I mean, everything seems fine to me. Let's keep pushing on. So let me reread this and see if anything new clicks. Let's just back up a little bit. So up here we say the builder has no way of knowing what should be used for the second call to the builder, spawning things. Oh, that's what they mean. It's not between... It's not between function calls. It's not like, okay, I thought it meant like state at a more global sense, like a single map builder for the application. Because every time we do call that, we are, let me break down what I was saying again. When we come in here and get a builder, this random builder is making a new simple map builder. This is a struct. It's an empty, there's no fields, but it is a struct, simple map builder. So it's making a new struct and it's boxing it up. It's a new pointer to a new struct. And then we're calling the code on that simple map builder. So what we're doing is we're saying, give us a new simple map builder. In this case, it's, it's random builder, but we know there's no randomness to it yet. And then... What we're saying, I think what they were trying to say is builder.buildmap is the same map builder. And this builder.spawnentities is that same map builder. But what threw me off is the way it was described. It made it sound like every time we do these things, it's the same map builder. It's not. It's a different map builder that's being created here in the mod, right? Again, new simple map builder. This is basically like a constructor or something, right? It's it's making a new struct. Just because it's, there's no fields doesn't, it's not special. I mean, it would be like um, data, blah. Like th this is a new struct, right? So let's see. Let's go back to the tutorial now and, and just get these bearings again. So that's the state. The state is just across a few function calls, but we don't keep the state, but it's fine. Because when we go to next level, we build a new map and we use that state to then build the rooms and to spawn things. And then we kind of throw all that away because we're done building the map. So I, again, I was thinking of state being like, what if you go to next level two or three or four times? To me, reading the tutorial made it sound like that state was being maintained. And I was like, I don't believe that. So, and we get back down here to where we were at. Um, we're keeping the builder object around. Again, only in the context of this code though. That's what threw me off. So subsequent calls to the builder will apply to the same implementation sometimes called concrete object, the fact, the object that actually physically exists. If we were to add five more map builders, the code in main.rs wouldn't care. We can add them to the factory and the rest of the program is blissfully unaware of the workings of the map builder. This is a very good example of how dynamic dispatch can be useful. You clearly, you have a clearly defined interface and the rest of the program doesn't need to understand the inner workings. So what we're saying here is um, really because of the um, random builder here. When you put two, three, four, five in here, any of those random builders can come out and you don't care because they all implement the build map and spawn entities. So when you do the dot build map and dot spawn entities, this box stein map builder is letting you call those functions. So there we go. Okay, that was a big aside for something that wasn't actually complex, but the wording threw me off. 
usually when I think of maintaining state, I think of it as a more of a long-term thing, not over like three function calls or really two. Um, and that's why it, it threw me off. So my apologies. <laughs> Adding a constructor to simple map builder. We're currently making a simple map builder as an empty object. What if it needs to keep track of some data? In case we need it, let's add a simple constructor to it and use that instead of a blank object. In simple map, we're going to modify the struct implementation as follows. And I literally just got done mentioning that as an example. Uh, I don't think it makes that much of a difference either way. Sorry. All right. Let's go to simple map builder and let's do that thing. I don't think we're going to be doing both sections today because this has taken a while. Um, which is disappointing, but I want to make sure we do it right, and I want to make sure we understand things. If if I get thrown off on something, I'm going to spend time on it. You know, I'm not. I'm not going to be uh, just just breeze through something and not understand it. You know, copy paste or whatever. So, impl simple map builder. Ah, I see the trick we're doing. Okay, so. Impl, simple, oh no, we already have one down there. I think you could put the same block more than once for the impl if you want to add more stuff, but we don't need to. So we're going to do public function new, new depth, i32, simple map builder, simple map builder. So this is interesting. We're not using that value, but we're putting it here as a placeholder, basically. So the thing we're probably going to have to keep in mind is that as we're doing this random builder, so there's actually a typo above. Let me go back to the tutorial and show the typo. Um, when we make the random builder function, notice that random builder here does not take any parameters. It's empty, right? But a thing that tripped me up is down here where we say random builder, it's taking current depth plus one. Now that's a little odd, isn't it? That's a, a typo because clearly there was a little bit of jumping back and forth when these snippets were pasted in. And that was a mistake because at least here we were told not to put anything in random builder. But here there is something and that, that happens occasionally. So now our new function here is taking a depth but we're not using it simple map builder doesn't care about that but if the the new interface to the random to the map builder stuff here random builder is our public interface if that's going to um specify that we need a uh a depth then other map builders that we work with in the future they might actually need that. And we may make simple map builder use it at some point. But what we can basically do is say, okay, now all of them have to have that in their new function. That way we're still kind of agreeing to an interface a little bit, if that makes sense. So it returns an empty object for now. So in mod.rs, we're going to change random builder to use it. New depth i32. And so instead of simple builder like that, we're going to say simple map builder and new, new depth, and all that should be happy. Alrighty. So it hasn't gained us anything, but it's a bit cleaner. When you write more maps, they may do something in their constructors. Exactly. So. Yeah, no, I don't need to run it again. I think we just we just ran. We didn't well cargo run release just real quick. Oh, I did make something mad in main. What's mad in main? Oh right. So current depth is one. This is what we saw earlier. And we'll just see how it's being used. That's a one. So this is the one that is current depth plus one. Um now, how do we do this one? Did they use something else? Did they use current? Hmm. We don't have current depth yet. <laughs> I mean, I guess we could... 
we could get current depth. We could literally do this code right here. We could do that. We're fetching that thing twice, which is unfortunate. Um, I would like to take a look at their code real quick. Um, source code, pull the browser up for you. I'm gonna go to main. Random builder. Okay, they just made it inside. Let's go to the next. Oh, yeah, duh. I could have thought of that too. <laughs> it's all right. Well, it, it's trying to smush two different ways that I've seen this. Like, this is not compatible with what they showed before. So what, what happened is clearly a little bit of mishmash. When, uh, when this was created, a little bit of mishmash happens. And probably there were bits and pieces that were added in. Um, bits and pieces were added in at different times. And he was like, oh, I need to, you know, we need to set the builder. And then he took the code from here and forgot to remove the current depth thing. And it is what it is. Um, world map does not need to be mutable. Why not? Why is it even here? I think I just did something dumb a minute ago, that's all. Let's ignore it. <laughs> World map equal. Okay, something weird is going on. World map resource equal builder dot get map. Oh, there's extra stuff. Oh, okay, yeah, there's changes that we haven't done yet. Um, okay, I'm looking at that tutorial and it's like, all right, we're gonna leave that mutable. We don't care because we're gonna be changing it. I think it probably got some goofiness a minute ago when I was uh, moving things around. Let's let's say it's fine. We'll trust it for the moment. So that um, the page I have pulled up there showing their code, that's the end of the chapter. So there's a get map that we haven't done yet. Um, that, you know, spoiler alert, I guess. Yeah, we have maps. Okay, good. We're working again. I don't care to run anymore. All right. So, let me get back over here, scroll back up, and find out where we were at. Cleaning up the trait, adding a constructor. So there we go. That's actually, yeah, we just tested. We just tested that actually doesn't change anything else now. Okay. Cleaning up the trait, simple obvious steps and single return types. Now that we've come this far, let's extend the trait a bit to obtain the player's position in one function, the map in another, and build slash spawn separately. Using small functions tends to make the code easier to read, which is a worthwhile goal in and of itself. In mod.rs, we change the interface as follows. And this is what I mentioned earlier when we first saw the, um, the way it was returning map and position here. I said, I don't think I like that. I think it would be better to split that up. And you see we're doing that now, so he agrees with me. So we're going to get map and fn get starting position and mute self position. Now, I'm wondering why these are mutable references. Getting the map and getting the position should probably not be mutable, I would think. So we'll see if there's a reason for that later. So build map no longer returns anything, which makes sense. Building and spawning shouldn't return anything. They should mutate things, they should do things, but 
I like the idea more like build it, then get it if you get it if you need it. If you don't need it, don't get it, right? It's a needless return. So there are a few things to note here. Um, build map no longer returns anything at all. We're using it as a function to build map state. Spawn entities no longer asks for a map parameter. Since all map builders have to implement a map in order to make sense, we're going to assume that the map builder has one. Oh, I didn't notice that. Spawn entities um no longer takes that so where is it coming from then are we getting it out of the world or what and spawn entities no longer takes the depth so i'm gonna get rid of that unless i put that in there by accident earlier actually no it, it it's gonna come from the map isn't it we do use the depth in spawn entities because it's actually the uh, some of the entities in the spawn table need the depth because they change as you get deeper in the dungeon. So that's also part of the map, though. So I think it's fine. We can pull it from there. Um, all right. So spawn entities no longer ask for map parameter. The map builder has to implement a map in order to make sense. Yeah, okay. Get map returns a map. Again, we're assuming that the builder implementation keeps one. Get starting position also assumes that the builder will keep one around. All right. So I was going to say, if that's the case, then we're going to have to add that in, in, and there we are. Okay. So obviously our simple map builder now needs to be modified to work this way. We'll start by modifying the struct to include the required variables. This is the map builder's state, and since we're doing dynamic object-oriented code, the state remains attached to the object. Here's the code from simplemap.rs. Map, map, starting, position, position, depth, i32. So, yeah, we just took a lot of stuff out of there in an interesting way. Next, we'll implement the getter functions. Should we also make the other things happy? Uh, it looks like we're going to be doing that in a bit. Okay. So we'll implement the getter functions. They're really easy. Simple map builder. Um, for simple map builder. Yoink. Get map is going to be self dot map dot clone so it's not a full getter so one of the things you would typically maybe think about is a getter would actually be to in my mind a reference this is not a traditional getter because it is duplicating it but it is, it's what we got okay and then self.startingposition.clone is just, we're gonna set that when we're building the map out, okay. We'll also update the constructor to create the state. New, where is new again? Right there. So simple map builder. Now we're gonna need to put some fields in and for map, it's gonna be map, new, new depth. Starting position is going to be position, Um, X, zero, Y, zero, and depth is probably going to be zero to start with. New depth. No, oh yeah, we're passing new depth in, my bad. So we are actually using new depth now. Okay. And we're going to modify starting position and map as we generate maps and stuff. Okay. So it also simplifies build map and spawn entities. So let's see, spawn entities no longer needs a couple of these. No longer needs that. And it no longer needs new depth, right? Yeah, it just needs the world and the and mute self. Um, for room and self.maps.rooms.iter.skip1. So we need to add the self there because we're holding the map. And then ECS room and uh, we're setting one there, self.depth. 
that was probably a typo. We were supposed to be using that value, but it's fine. Um, I think I might have copied that or something. I don't know. So for each room, we do all the spawning. That's easy enough. Build map actually got a lot simpler. So simple map builder rooms and corridors. But there's an interesting difference. We no longer pass anything in there. And we're not returning anything. Okay, so what let's let's break this down real quick because it may be a little confusing what's going on. Um before we get to this next part. Simple map builder now has data on it. So rooms and corridors is this impl it's it's been implemented for simple map builder. And what it used to do is actually spit data out. Well, now that we're holding that data as part of the map builder, then it's going to assign to itself. Um, yeah. So I do find it interesting, however, that maybe it's not going to assign to itself. We'll see how it works because we're not passing any reference to it or anything. This is like calling a almost like a static function, if you will, static method or something. So I, I might be missing one component here on where the data is going to be assigned. So we'll see how that actually works. Okay. So we'll need to modify rooms and corridors to work with this interface. Yes, indeed. So rooms and corridors now takes an end mute self. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay. And not too much should change, I guess. Oh, I think I know what's happening. I think I know what's happening. Okay, we're going to say self.map. <laughs> we're going to copy that. I could do a replace, but we're doing it this way. You expected... Okay, I'm going to be having to make a couple extra changes. Yeah. We're passing these into functions, so we need the end mute. We're using it locally, we don't need this. But we're passing it into the functions, we need to get the references. So here, that works, that works, that works, that works, that works. Yep. Okay. But we're not actually assigning things and doing stuff as we need to. So first of all, rooms and corridors no longer returns anything. So this will get mad now. Um, basically here at the end, we're doing the start position thing. Let's say self.starting position equal position. You know what? I could use what I already had. All right, so that should cover most of it. We're pushing the rooms into the map. Um, we're applying the tunnels in the map. It's all self.map. So there's one thing that's maybe losing me a little bit. Yeah. I... I think it's maybe a typo as well. Could it not be self dot rooms and corridors? So the tutorial does have simple map builder rooms and corridors, and that's like a static method. If you basically, when you're doing an impl block, right, if you define 
Well, well, this is a perfect example. Um, pub function new. If you don't have a self parameter in it, it's like what you might call a static method or something where you're not calling it on an instance of that struct. You're calling it just as a generic, like a general function, right? So it'd be like a static method in Java or something. So from here, we do simple map builder new. That's all great, right? But we can't do, like we can't take a simple map builder that we've made and then call dot new on it. Because when you do that dot notion, a uh, dot notation, like self dot something, um, well, in this case, we're accessing data. But when you do self dot some function, um, like in this case, that function has to have that dot um, or that uh, self parameter as its first parameter. So I was looking for a better example. Um, I don't know if we have a good example down here, but I think that's that's a bit of a typo in the tutorial. That's another one of those that threw me off for a second when I'm looking at it because I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Um, rooms and corridors, we do see does take an end mute self. So the only way to call that is as we saw. If we switch it back to simple map builder, rooms and corridors, we see that it expects an argument. And it says an argument of type end mute simple map simple map builder is missing because that's the end mute self. So good to note, work through the little errors like that and we should be fine. So this is very similar to what we had before, but now uses self.map to refer to its own copy of the map and stores the player position in self.starting position. Calls into the new code in main.rs, once again, change. The call from go to next level now looks like this. <laughs> we keep changing it every few minutes. Um, it's fine, but it gets annoying sometimes when you're doing that. Like, it's not even like a, a slight on the tutorial. When you do refactors of your own code, what you'll often do is be like, I want to make it this way. And then as you do that, it's like, all right, now I can do this. And you go through phases of refactoring and you end up having to do stuff like this a lot. It's not a slight against the tutorial. So let me world map resource. Okay. Current depth. Okay. Builder. Map builder trying to build a current depth plus one. Um, builder dot build map current depth plus one and then world map resource is new map but it's actually builder dot get map so we do get map and then builder dot start um, get starting position Nothing else changes. We repeat those changes for the others. Um, why are you mad? Oh, because we no longer need to pass that stuff in. No longer need that. It needs... Hold on, sorry. It doesn't need the world map because the map is part of it. It doesn't need the depth. All it needs is the world, the ECS, the world, world. I can, <laughs> I don't know why that just, don't worry about it. Um, let builder, mm, no, 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 builder equal. No, we already have the builder. We made it above, my bad. How do we do it? above oh we did it differently in both cases i see in the other one i put the builder i declared it up here let me builder semicolon and then i actually assigned it down here so yeah we don't need to do that here i don't know why i did it slightly differently We can actually get rid of the whole line, can't we? Builder dot build map. And that's a one. And this is builder get map. Builder dot get 
starting position. And then this is no world map needed, no one needed, because that's built into the builder now. Alrighty. And last but not least, this one here. So we get a random builder, builder.build map one. And then, let's see, where is the map being used? Let's just get rid of that and see who needs what. Let player start equal builder.get starting positions. <laughs> just kind of assigning it and then immediately destructuring it. So what would be better is this. We'll destruct, wait. Starting position. Oh, we could destructure it from here, I guess. Can't I do this here? I don't know. I'm trying some janky stuff all of a sudden. Um, X. Y. <laughs> yeah, I can. Um, struct destructuring. You didn't know about it. Now you do. And then builder.getMap. All right, there's a lot of weird stuff going on there. Um, let me explain struct destructuring. So we could destructure a tuple, right? We already know about that. Um, let my data equal one, two, three. Right, we can mix data types in the tuple like that. So it's an i32, i32 string. And I could say let a, b, s. I will say x, y, S equal my data. Uh, whoops, there we go. Put that parenthesis here for no reason. So now you can see X is being, it's an I32. Y is an I32. S is a string slice and, S, and STR, ampersand STR. We can do the same thing with structs, kind of. Um, I more recently learned about struct destructuring. But basically, it's a form of pattern matching, and you can basically use pattern matching as a way to destructure a lot of things. Um, you can use it as a part of a match statement. You can use this as a part of an if let. We may have looked at that here before. I don't remember. Uh, I, I, we have on stream. I don't remember if it was part of this tutorial or not. But you can actually pattern match on structs, and you can like filter on filters a, a loose term here but you can kind of use pattern matching on a struct to just pick out different pieces. Say it has like 10 different um, members, 10 different data members on the struct, but you only care about two of them for your match. You can just like check those two and then like, de you know, just ignore all the rest. Or you could then assign some of those to like variables that you want to like rip out of the struct or, or whatever. There's all kinds of different ways you can do this struct destructuring. Um, it's really cool to look into, but that's basically what I'm doing here. Um, because get starting position returns a position, which is a struct, and position is a struct with an X and a Y field, we can do this pattern here to say we're gonna rename the X to player X, which is the value that we're using down here. I didn't wanna rename it elsewhere in the code, and I didn't feel like getting a position here and then doing position dot X and position dot Y. We're just gonna rip it out here. I mean, yeah, that, that's maybe cleaner and maybe easier to read if you don't, especially if you don't know Rust, that's maybe easier to read. But I was lazy in this case. And I was like, let's do some weird stuff because it's fun. So that was a, a good opportunity to do that. You know, it lets me be lazy because I was like, I don't know how much, actually player X is being used in two places. I was like, I don't know how much that's being used. I don't want to have to hunt them down and change everything. So if I can make this spit out something that works, I'm happy. So that's what we did here. Okay. 
Um, and I think everything is happy now. So the tutorial says we basically repeat the changes for the others, meaning I did this in three different places. Um, and now we have a pretty comfortable interface into the map builder. It exposes enough for, to be easy to use without exposing the details of the magic it uses to actually build the map. If you cargo run the project now... Actually, cancel that. Let me make sure I'd saved. If you cargo run the project now, once again, nothing visible has changed. It still works the way it did before. When you're refactoring, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, unit tests are particularly valuable for refactoring if it's something that you can make work with your code. Unit tests can be difficult in some cases. Um, there are other things like integration tests and all that. Um, unit tests in a video game work best to test small pieces of logic, like if you have an inventory system or something that, um, you know, could be fragile if you're making a lot of changes to it. You know, you can make sure that um, the logic still behaves the same way as you're making those changes. Um, looks like everything is good here. Um, I've been working on a project that involves, like, generating potions and stuff, and the logic is a little bit confusing. I mean, not super confusing, but the way the logic is, is done, I wanted to make sure that if I make any minor tweaks, that I still get expected results from the potions. Um, so... It took a little bit to uh, to get that worked out, but uh, it's good. It's good now. So then if I make changes, I can see that, oh, did I break it or not, right? So if I give these ingredients with these effects, what potions do I get in return? Unit tests are, are a great sanity check, especially when you're refactoring. All right, so the question here. So why do maps still have rooms? Rooms don't actually do much in the game itself. They're an artifact of how we build the map. It's quite possible that later map builders won't actually care about rooms, at least not in the here's a rectangle, we're calling it a room sense. So let's try and remove that abstraction out of the map and also out of the spawner. As a first step in map.rs, we remove the room structure completely. Oh my goodness. Maps.rs. It's been a while since we've touched it. So, just remove it. Interesting change here that's not being commented on. Remember, I copied this. Um, I basically have this as a, a fresh clone from the last lesson. Oh, wait, no, no, that's why. Okay. I was looking at the um, the new, my bad. I was going to say, why are we not skipping the serializing and stuff? Because we did that before, because this is this is computed. We don't have to save that. And entities pose problems, too, so it's fine. Okay, good. Because I, I was like looking at the tutorial, and I saw that, and I didn't see it down here, and I was like, wait, what? All right, so tiles, rooms is gone. Now our code's going to get angry. <laughs> we also remove it from the new function. Take a look at your IDE. You'll notice you've only broken code in simple map.rs. We weren't using the rooms anywhere else, which is a pretty big clue that they don't belong in the map we're passing around throughout the main program. We can fix simple map by putting rooms into the builder rather than the map. We'll put it into the structure. Yeah, so the question is the map doesn't have the room the the builder or whatever has the knowledge of what rooms are because different maps may rooms may not make sense for like an open cavern or something um okay so simple map builder we're gonna add rooms back rect and instead of self.map.rooms it requires we fix up the constructor um, and spawn in the spawn function is just self dot rooms yeah um, I don't think anything else is going to be needed to be changed there in constructor we just add a new vec and then down here everywhere we're doing self dot map dot rooms yeah, map dot rooms becomes self dot rooms.
And there we are. Cargo run, nothing changed, right? That's the idea. Let's see. And then we're going to do a wrap up, which is always really short. A little paragraph. Yeah, this took about two hours, so we're not going to do another lesson today, unfortunately. I really wanted to. I knew this was going to take a while. I started late, as is. And this week's a weird week, where my office days are Tuesday and Wednesday. Not Wednesday and Thursday. Apparently some people are here this week. I don't know what they do. I don't know why it matters for me. Um... I mean, it has it has something to do with like the focus of our team and all that, but it has nothing to do with me directly. But they want us in the office on the days they're here, like management does. Fair right, whatever. Still, still just two days in a week. You're not making me drive more. I'm like whatever. But that means I got to get some sleep. All right. So everything worked. No surprises. Had a couple snags there today. A couple little bugs and stuff uh, in the code we got to work through. Um, where was the last one? We just saw it a few minutes ago. As an example. Oh, this... Um, we were calling that simple map builder rooms and corridors thing. The way we were calling it was incorrect. The way it's being called here is incorrect. This here, simple map builder rooms and corridors, stuff like that. That'll get you if you don't, like if you're new. These are the things like maybe I should contact and say, hey, there's some problems here and there. Um, I might want to do that because you know, if you're new to Rust or newer to programming in general, whatever, um, you might get caught up more on something like that. Like the, the moment I saw it, you, you know, you saw me when I was writing the code and I was like, well, this is interesting because it's like a static method or something like I don't know how this is going to work. I was trying to piece together, like, how is this going to do what we want it to do? Well, the trick is it doesn't, because this is called on self. So, yeah, there's some oddities like that that I've been noticing. It's, it's happened more as we've gone deeper, unfortunately. Anyway, this was an interesting chapter to write, because the objective is to finish with code that operates exactly as it did before. But with the map builder cleaned into its own module, completely isolated from the rest of the code, that gives us a great starting point to start building new map builders without having to change the game itself. Indeed. All right, so now we're going to look at the map building test harness next time. And it is shorter, significantly shorter. It's about... I'm looking at the scroll bar, and on this one we go just a little bit past this line here. And then if we go to map building test harness, that's like the midpoint. So it's almost um, half the length. But um, I still don't want to do it today because I already kind of talked about it. I'm tired and stuff. I want time to relax for a little bit before I go to bed. And um, maybe I got, a pro I got that project I mentioned, one of the ones I've been working on. I've got it in a good state now or at least an initial working state. It, it, the web assembly is is good to go i'm actually hosting it and like people can access it so it's really cool i want to get that um like just rebuilt and, and rehosted without the uh, <laughs> embarrassing amount of uh updating commits where i was like the web isn't i don't know what was going on but basically i i built it locally everything's fine then i switched to building web assembly and hosting locally everything is fine but then I would take the build, the WebAssembly build, I'd push it up to hosting, and it wouldn't work. I was like, but it works locally, even WebAssembly. So in Rust, you, you can use trunk, and you can do trunk serve to host it locally on, on 127.0.0.1 uh, port 8080, and you can access it from there, and it's fine. But then, like I said, I'm, I'm taking that dist when you do a trunk build. I'm taking that dist folder, which is your build, and just feeding it up to the host and it's like not working and there were some weird oddities i don't know how i fixed it that's the biggest problem i kept adding more log statements and just shifting logic around like um slight refactors like let me just try refactoring a little i, I didn't change the behavior i mean I, maybe i did but again everything worked always locally 
it just didn't work remotely. And then it just suddenly did. And I removed all the log statements. I cleaned up the refactors and stuff and it never stopped working again. So whatever, okay. Very weird stuff. Actually, no, one big change I made was um, caching and all that. I, I got rid of caching. And I don't know if that, that could have made a difference. Um, you know what? No. Maybe it did. Hmm. Maybe it did make a difference. Maybe, I don't know. It wouldn't have... Maybe. I don't know. I just had an idea of something I, ch I could check. I don't really want that app caching that much anyway, though. I don't really... For what it's doing, I don't really like the idea of of it caching because it's a very simple thing it's a thing you load up you do some stuff and then you're done having it save your state is a little bit mm, i don't know anyway um this map harness stuff cleaning up map creation do not repeat yourself also called dry so i'm just taking a look we're gonna change some stuff around oh it's because we're, we're repeatedly yeah, we have the same code three times. When the program starts, we insert a map, we change the level. Yeah, so that's what we're doing there. I mentioned that roll of three earlier. That's a really good time to say, hey, maybe refactor it. Um, go to the various parts of the code that call the same code we just added. Yeah. Clean up, game over, clean up. So that's some more refactoring to get us started. Very basic refactoring. But then making a generator, it's surprisingly difficult to combine, to combine two paradigms sometimes. Graphical tick nature of RLTK and the underlying GUI environment encourages you to do everything fast in one fell swoop. Actually visualizing progress while you generate a map encourages you to run in lots of phases as a state machine, yielding map results along the way. First thought was coroutines, specifically generators. They really are ideal for this type of thing. You can write code in a function that runs synchronously in order and yields values as the computation continues. I even went so far as to get a working implementation, but it required nightly support, unstable, unfinished Rust, and didn't play nicely with WebAssembly, so I scrapped it. There's a lesson here. Sometimes the tooling isn't quite ready for what you really want. So this tutorial, I think, is a couple years old. And this may be supported by now. I'm not sure. This is the link to the Unstable book. Rust Generators. Generator. <laughs> uh, it may still be unstable. Some things remain unstable for years. Um, generic associative types, GATs, were just made stable last week in Rust, or, well, in the new release that hit last week. Um... Apparently it was like five years. A lot of people say it should not have taken that long, but it's an open source kind of thing and whatever gets attention gets attention. But they've been in nightly for a while. Um, so he's going with the traditional route of maps taking a snapshot while they generate. And then the snapshots can be played frame by frame. Cool. Not quite as nice as a coroutine, but it works and is stable. Those are desirable. So the coroutine stuff could be cool. The generators, um, I've seen those before in Python. I don't have a lot of experience with them, but yeah, I mean, basically what it says as the copy, it, it's it's kind of like fake asynchronous, right? And that it just like runs through and like, here's some stuff that I got. Here's some more stuff that I got. It's cool. I like it. But I'm... Um, yeah, I'm just looking through, and this is a little bit more than I want to do tonight. Problem is, binary space partitioning. This one here, eh, that's about the same. Maybe I could squeeze both of these on Wednesday. Given that I don't have to go to the office on Thursday, I can maybe go a little bit later Wednesday. Because we, I want to see this. This is cool. I want to get this going. And then we're going to be using this all the time from here on out because I've already seen some of the other um, sections here. All right. Enough of me talking about random things and not wrapping up the stream. <laughs> Thank you to anyone who showed up. I really appreciate it. If you are new, hit the follow button. I would appreciate that. 
If you are watching this in the future on YouTube, I appreciate that and congrats on being in the future. I always like saying congrats first. I threw myself off. Um, if you do all the fun YouTube stuff, I'd appreciate that. Like licking that like button, kicking that subscribe button, and notification bell. You can leave a comment. I do read them, try to respond. Um, as for the streams here, these coding streams are Monday and Wednesday. All my other streams, uh, two streams on Saturday and Sunday, and one stream every other day is gameplay, if you're interested in that. Um, and yeah, we already talked about where we're going to go next time. This test harness, we already got a little sneak peek at it. We're going to try and do BSP, Binary Space Partitioning Room, Dungeons as well. We'll see if it works out. But that's it. Um, I don't think I want to say anything else. Uh, i got to sneeze anyway, so it's a perfect time to say... Till next time, have a good day, have a good night, whatever it is, wherever you're at. Take it easy. Raiden, what's your status? Colonel, I've got Emma Emmerich here. We've managed to avoid drowning. Good job.